Thank you, everybody, for tuning in today to the Adam Messer Show. And this episode is brought to you by Valhalla Books. Their inaugural anthology is out, The Devil's Do. And you can check that out at ValhallaBooks.com. All right, everybody, thank you for tuning in. And you are listening to the Adam Messer Show. I'm your host, Adam Messer. And my special guest for this hour is David Harlan Rousseau. David, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Be on. Yeah, I'm pretty excited, uh, everybody. Uh, Patrick Roper uh, introduced me to David, and you know Patrick's been on the show a couple different times, and uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm excited to have you here. Uh, David, do you mind giving our audience like a little introduction about yourself? Uh, sure. Um, I am a, a writer and an illustrator. I do some acting and some directing, and I also am a professor at Savannah College of Art and Design. Uh, where I teach in the School of Foundation Studies. Very cool. Very cool. And, uh, yeah, we, we love SCAD. SCAD's, like, all over the place down here. Mm-hmm. So, pretty exciting. Um, so, yeah, Bass, are you you up to it? Okay. All right. So, um, last hour, Sebastian wasn't – his allergies have been acting up, so he wasn't feeling, like, uh, up to playing, but he's he wants to play a little bit now. So, here is Sebastian Messer, everybody. best that's pretty good so yeah david um so i'm i'm excited to have you here like i said uh they the creative community we have in savannah is just amazing i feel like there are so many um interesting people and uh that's one of the things i loved with this show being able to talk with authors and artists and entertainers and you you seem like you do quite a bit um how did you get started in your creative career uh, well, when I was little, you know, like seven years old and that thereabouts, I had a, a tumor in my left ear, and that pretty much took me out of learning how to ride a bike and hanging out with the kids in the playground and that sort of thing. Uh, and that allowed me to turn inward and get very interested in storytelling, whether that was through drawing or writing or performing. That's awesome. Yeah, I love I love to draw and uh, to write stories. What uh, what do you like to write about? I find a lot of the narratives that I have these days tend to be uh, a bit more grounded. You know, really talking about communities, places, uh, how uh, people interact with one another on, on a very basic level. And I find that the interesting thing about writing uh, stories at that level is that you really start to understand it's high drama can be the smallest thing. High drama can be having to get to work by needing to take public transportation on a rating day. And when it's like your last opportunity to get that job or get that interview, it seems like the whole world is up against you. Those narratives to me, I think, are far more compelling and engaging and intriguing than uh, some of the a lot of the fare we're getting uh, these days with science fiction and, and the like. I I find that interesting, actually, um, because when you say high drama, can you drill that down a little bit for the audience who might not be familiar with it? Well, there's a lot of different you know uh, takes on you know, high drama. You know, we, we tend to think uh, of these big, epic, sweeping tales of mm-hmm. emperors and kings and, and princesses all going against these odds, but on a grand global scale. And I tend to think of it more in terms of intensity. That is for whatever level the character is at, for them, the act that they're going through is everything in that moment. Mm -hmm. And whether it's, you know, uh, trying to reconnect with with a relative or trying to make that first big break, anything like that, if it's relatable, if it's something that people can wrap their heads around, uh, these are the sorts of things that 
any person can get a hold of and, and tie into, uh, no matter where they are in, in economic status mm-hmm. or social status. I think that's a. I think that is a great equalizer with uh, with emotions and connecting with the human condition. You know, uh, I read a story the other day. <clears throat> Do you, did you ever hear the story about how hot Cheetos came to be? No. Okay, so I feel like it relates really well to what you're talking about. Um, I don't remember the guy's name, and I apologize. Uh, but sure. the the article there was a guy who worked for Frito Lay. And he, um, the company had a policy where it was an open door policy. And if you had an idea, you could, you could go all the way up to the chain of, you know, with talking to the CEO or whatever. And so this guy calls the CEO up and, uh, he's talking with the CEO. This guy had spent a lot of time learning about free delay and, you know, they, they offer these different, like, um, continuing education type things, you know, especially about their product and their service and stuff like that. And so this guy had spent a lot of his, his time learning about, you know, free to lay and learning about how the company worked and operated and things like that. And so the CEO is talking with this guy and he's like, you know, what are you like a VP of marketing or, you know, da, 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 da. And he's like, no, and he's like, you know, chief operating officer. No. Um, he's like, I'm, I'm one of the janitors at one of the facilities. And the CEO was so impressed with him that he flew him out there to meet with him. And this guy had an idea. He was he was in these stores, and he saw these uh, he saw these uh, Hispanic products with this you know hot and spicy you know chips and things like that. And this guy was like, you know what? This you know Frito Lay didn't have anything like that at all at the time. And this guy was like, well, you know, this is a great opportunity for us. So this guy made like 50 bags of hot Cheetos, like little zipper bags, Ziploc bag type things with his own spices that he um, that he made. And he he actually drew the little logo on the bag or whatever. And he did this presentation for these folks. And that's how hot Cheetos was born. By this guy's, you know, dedication and care and innovation and the idea that he had where he was like, you know what, there's this there's this need. There's there are these products that people like. We're not doing it. And we're the biggest, you know, chip company in the world. Um, and that's how that's all these hot Cheetos and hot flavored stuff that, she, that Frito-Lay is doing was born. <laughs> and it just reminds me of what you're talking about with like, you know, that. I guess the appeal to emotion or the, the appeal to that human condition where we can all see it. It doesn't have to necessarily be some kind of epic drama. It could be in like, you know, someone riding the bus, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and that Cheeto story reminds me a little bit of Harry Beck, uh, who was, uh, working for the London underground railroad, the tube as it were. And Harry Beck was actually unemployed at the time. So he had a little bit of time on his hands. But what he wound up doing was just paying attention to the world around him. And he was watching how people use the underground, the, the subway system in London, the tube. Uh, and in the early 1930s, 1933, thereabouts, Harry Beck wound up uh, being an electrical draftsman, understood circuitry, and he redesigned the maps or the diagrams of the London tube system, uh, where everything was more or less uh, either vertical, horizontal, or 45 degrees, color-coded uh, with stops along the way. And it looks like a circuit board. Does it really truly reflect the geography of London? No, not even close. But it did set a standard for other public transportation systems thereafter. Uh, later on, Massimo Vignelli would basically steal that design concept and redo the New York City subway system um, after he and Bob Norder redid all the signage for the for the New York City subway system. So if you're paying attention to the world around you, and I guess the point of going on like that, is if you're paying attention to the world around you, there's all sorts of discoveries you can make. And those discoveries uh, make for interesting narratives, whether it is a documentary or whether it's a a narrative, um, or whether it's just coming up with a better idea to make people's lives just this much better. Yeah, I think that's that's really awesome too. And and you know what? I kind of think I feel like it's you don't necessarily it doesn't have to be on a grand scale like that either. It could be just like 
a it could be a nuance of improving something in your own life or you know maybe your spouse or your coworker or something like that you know it's just kind of seeing a need and filling a need and saying hey you know how can we make this better yeah, I mean, a simple thing, uh, for example, when COVID broke out, uh, there was a nurse who was wearing masks all day long. We all started having to wear face masks uh, for all of this. Um, that she discovered that you could put an elastic loop through a simple button, and that elastic loop would go on the frames of your glasses, and you could get the mask off of your ears and yeah. just put it on the button loop on, on the edge of your glasses. And that um, saved a lot of wear and tear for healthcare workers it's been adopted by some civilians, uh, but it's just paying attention. It's really thinking about, this is inconvenient, how can I make it better? Or, if you're a writer, this is inconvenient, how can I raise the stakes and make this really uncomfortable for my protagonist, so mm-hmm. that the audience feels that empathy and distress at the same time. How do you do that um, with your storytelling? Well, it depends on the narrative uh, in and of itself, but I think the first thing is your characters don't have to be relatable. Your characters have to be, or likable, rather. They don't have to be likable. They have to be relatable. Um, so you can say, oh, yeah, I can see myself in that character, you know, or, boy, that reminds me of my aunt or my uncle or my ex door neighbor. And then from there, you put them in a position where they are really... Uh, we often hear like the fish out of water, but but in a situation where they're really now taken out of their element and forced to make that decision that sends them on the journey. Um, so a good example of that in recent memory of the popular show Queen's Gambit is, is the lead character in Queen's Gambit. She herself you know, someone that you would really want to hang out with on a regular basis. Maybe not. She's, a, she's very smart, but she's got a lot of issues. And usually people with that kind of issues, you want to protect yourself from those. Right. But yet at the same time, we recognize in her, like, there's something that, that she's struggling for. She's self-medicated, but she's hyper-intelligent. Um, she's hyper-focused. There's one thing that she wants most in the world is to be the best there is in chess and not to be the best in chess for anyone else, but for her. Right. And because we understand that, and because we understand all the odds of what's happening, uh, to her in her life, we then develop an empathy for her when these things are threatened, either through her own action or through the actions of those around her. And that's putting in something that everyone can relate to because it's, it's such a hugely popular show. But I try to do the same kinds of things. So what is this thing that this character wants that they can't have? Mm. And what happens if they don't get it? Right, and right. it doesn't have to be mm-hmm. world domination. It could just be, I need a job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a really good point, uh, David. At the, you know, I actually had that, dis- that same discussion with one of uh, my authors because I was reading this manuscript and I didn't like the character. I did not like the character at all. Um, mm-hmm. And I didn't feel like the character was relatable either. And we had the we had this discussion, um, you know, about uh, have you uh, I, you probably have, but have you ever read that book Save the Cat by Blake Snyder? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, like, you know, for everybody out there, like, Save the Cat, it literally is is like a scene just you know saving the cat, kind of distinguishes who's the good guy and who's the bad guy or not the good guy or whatever. But it it's something that's relatable, like you know, like you're talking about. Something that where you might not necessarily like the person, but you can empathize with them or whatever. And so this author and I were we were talking about him. We were having this conversation, and um, you know, I was just like, I just don't really like this character, you know. And um, I didn't, I hadn't read the whole manuscript. I, I read the first couple of chapters or whatever, and they were like, well, there's a reason, there's a reason, there's a reason, there's a reason. And I was like, well, you know, I I get it. And I mean, it's a great story. Don't get me wrong. It's a great story. But one of the things that I brought up to this per- the, the person was like, you know, if it's not likable, if the person's not likable and they're not relatable, um, then it's going to be difficult for people to continue to read. It's like they're, you know, there better be a really good payoff for the, the reason why they're, you know, having to deal with this intolerable person, you know? And uh, 
So I agree with you that those are some major points. Like, you know, we all love the anti-hero. Like, that's so popular now. You know, it's like it's like you like the person that is not likable or they're a jerk or whatever because you're like, oh, that's a bad guy, you know. That's real popular right now. Um, but they have to be relatable, too. It's like, why, do, why does she want to be the world's best chess player? You know, why, why does, you know, Lex Luthor want to defeat Superman? You know, why, why are these things, you know, happening, you know? And uh, if we can't relate to them, if we can't say, oh, you know, whatever, if it's just a story that's kind of rambling along, then it's not going to capture the audience and nobody's going to really enjoy it, you know? So I think that's a big part of the problem that we're all facing as viewers when it comes to superhero movies. Mm Mm-hmm. Hold on for yeah, a second. Hold that thought for just a second. I got to do the station ID already. Um, everybody, you're tuning in today to WRUU LP Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings Community Radio with Global Soul. All right. So, yeah, I agree with you. Um, what uh, What's your take on that, though? With, with uh, superhero movies? Yeah. Like? Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting because I think we all really want to go and enjoy these films, but time after time, especially recently, uh, there's been a spate of superhero movies that have come out, and people go in there expecting to be remarkably entertained, and they come out just feeling really let down by the experience. And I think that we're losing a bit of relatability uh, in that regard. Uh, when you have a superhero who's so powerful that the villain has to be almost ridiculously powerful, we kind of lose that, that angst that the person needs to feel. By contrast, you watch something like The Mandalorian, uh, who you, you could, I suppose, arguably consider the Mandalorian is a superhero as Batman would be right. uh, in that regard. Um, but what you get about the Mandalorian uh, is that Din Djarin is a remarkably complex character. He's got, you know, basically he's a very skilled bounty hunter, but he's not much of a people person. <laughs> he's really not. Right. But when he finally gets that change of heart and realizes that his protective nature starts kicking in, um, then viewers really start to pay more attention. Like, oh, man, I get it. This is all or nothing for him through him protecting the child. Right. Uh, but we don't get that all or nothing feeling from a lot of these superhero movies because their personalities are, are such that, oh, they're so identifiably the hero. Okay, well, maybe they've got flaws and maybe they don't. But... At the same time, where's the distress? Where's the empathy distress combination that make us really understand? Yeah, this is the payoff. Yeah, you know, uh, it's like um, you know, Disney just released Soul, and I watched Soul. When, and then me, yeah, in all fairness, I may have gone into watching that with remarkably high expectations uh, because of Disney and its Pixar. Right. Um, but there was something missing in that that narrative, uh, some of which was just in terms of representation, where I don't think the main character got enough voice in that film, um, where we get to really explore his journey uh, uh, from what he needed versus what he wanted. And sometimes those things are very different. We never got to feel that, ultimately, in that narrative, you know, without belaboring on the fact. And that's something that was a missed opportunity in that there's a lot at stake there. Um, there were opportunities that could have been explored with his mother more deeply. There are opportunities that could have been explored with him and his music. And of course, like uh, with the one student that was about to give up, I mean, there's so much stuff that could have been just really deeply rooted into what this person really had to offer the world around him. And, I, and this is just my opinion. There's plenty of people out there that might disagree with me on it, but I really felt that they did a disservice to the main character in that animated film uh, because of that. They, they missed the heart of the, of the story. I feel like that's a common theme with uh, different uh, people of color animation stories. I've seen that over and over again um, where it's, it's, it's almost like a letdown because you expect it to be a certain way and then it's not representative of, uh, of that you know, person's culture or whatever and um i like to see i like to see different stuff out there you know i like to see um you know people of color uh narratives by people of color you know um that jingle jangle show the movie uh, like i've seen the previous for it 
I haven't been watching anything lately, um, really. Um, but that one looks like it's a really good show. And it's just a different, you know, it's a different take on a Christmas story. And I like the idea of that because, you know, there are so many ways to explore characters. But one of the things I feel like is so important, especially in our, our world today, is like pushing, not pushing, not even pushing. OK, so I don't even want to say it like that, um, like m- making the uh, platform available for people of color to be able to tell the stories that they want to tell and have those narratives, you know, where it's like, hey, this is what it is. And it's not going to I mean, like, you know, honestly, it's not going to be like everything's going to be like a five star you know, movie or whatever. But make it so it's like available to show those those narratives. And, uh, you know, for example, like with comics or, you know, movies or, you know, whatever there there's a need for it. You know, there's a need for people to be out there telling their stories. And, you know, on any kind of story, there's going to be like miss the mark on some things and other things or whatever. Like, for example, I haven't watched the last couple of Star Wars movies and I haven't watched The Mandalorian either. And a friend of mine, we were talking about it, and I was I was disenfranchised by the um, the uh, Force Awakens. I was like, I just didn't really care for it, and I didn't watch the next two movies. Um, I've been a Star Wars fan my whole life, and my friend and I were talking about the Mandalorian, and they were like, "Well, it doesn't feel like Star Wars. It is Star Wars." And I was like, "Well, that's pretty cool because that's what I you know would enjoy. I don't want I don't want a story that doesn't feel like natural with it." You know, I don't. I don't want a you know round peg in a square hole, where somebody's trying to you know tell a story just to be like, oh, I just want to make it you know like I just wanted to make it cringeworthy because I've got these characters I want to play. No, it's like if you if you have a genre or if you have like for example, I get the whole juxtaposition of things, you know. But like if I if I go to see a vampire movie, there better be vampires. I don't want to see a movie yeah. about you know fairies and you know woodland and stuff like that i want to see a movie about vampires and i feel like that kind of goes back to storytelling it's like uh well what is this why why are these parts why did those parts let me down what was my expectation with that how could you know how could they have done a different job and it's always you know it's always really nice on our side as audience members and like as readers and stuff like that it's always really cool to be able to say hell you know it'd be cool if they did this or they did that when we're given like you know a a a fair and and um how do i say it a fair and just criticism or review right yeah but there are people out there that they just like to troll (laughs) and so you know i i don't know man it's it's crazy i Sometimes things are, or, you know, people like certain things, and sometimes they don't. So, well, I, th- I think a lot of the, the trolls out there, everybody's certainly entitled to their opinion on, on what it is. It's just better when it's an informed opinion, right? Right. Yeah. And what that ultimately means is really doing a deep dive. And for people who are in, you know, either they're writers, they write novels, uh, or or they're in film and television, uh, that world. Uh, entertainers in that regard, or or they're just really good analysts. They're, they're really solid critics, but they have a deep understanding of cinematic history mm-hmm. or literary history. That those people can come back in and say, "This is why this works. This is why it doesn't." But I think too many of us, uh, and, and more often than not, me self included, tend to lose sight of empathy. Yeah, uh, th- yeah. that we 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 have a tendency not for the creator's part. Now, uh, necessarily, but for what's going on with the characters. And so, for people that might jump out and say, well, that's not, like, what I would call, for, for like, people who are historical reenactors, red counters. Well, that's not accurate, because, look, that should have four rivets and not three rivets. Mm-hmm. That's kind of losing the point <laughs> yeah, yeah. of what's going on with the characters. You know, if you're watching a lot of Korean dramas, which are fantastic, uh, and most of them set in the Chosun Dynasty because it was the longest dynasty in Korea, uh, Korea's history. Um, but you watch some of that, it's like, okay, is that technically not the way that would work? But boy, they got the narrative right. They got the relationship of the characters and the personalities and the ensemble of these various people working yeah, together. And it's yeah. relatable even if you don't speak the language. I think that is a, a great point that you make. Because 
we have that human condition. It doesn't matter where you're from, you know, social, economic, or political background. We all have that human condition, and we can all relate to a good story, you know. And I think that's a, that's such a really good point that you bring up. Um, one of the things I feel like with that is that when you have, like, for example, I've never seen those Korean uh, the Korean movies like that. But mm-hmm. I feel like that, like those kind of movies, if they make it to an American market and they're being translated or they're you know whatever, and they're making it you know to an audience like yourself, either you're looking for it or you kind of came across it, and mm-hmm. in order to keep your attention, in order to you know get past that you know the cultural barrier or the language barrier or whatever. You know, they're, they've they've got to have a good story, you know, because you have to kind of overcome a couple of barriers first just to, to view the story. So what do you think about that? Well, uh, I mean, there's a lot of things. Like people know when people are miserable. Mm. <laughs> if you have an ounce of empathy in you at all, you, you know that people are miserable. You know that someone wants to be loved. You know that someone wants to succeed. You know that someone is just sick and tired of being marginalized and left on the side of the road. Yeah. Even though they work incredibly hard to get to where they are. Yeah. But they're, but they're forgotten. And, and, and they're ignored. And, and then, of course, what we really, you know, uh, where our hearts tend to go out to are people constantly get damn way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They get in their own way. And you watch it, you're like, why did you just get in your own way? If you had just listened for just a moment, or if you would taken that breath, or you decided to sit down for a moment rather than walk out that door, mm-hmm. your life would have been very, very different. Uh, it would have been, um, you know, wonderful. And, and then, of course, then we see people do things against their own better interests because of pride or because of fear. Uh, people don't. And this is the thing about writing characters. You never want to write a character who makes a stupid decision. You want to write a character who makes an emotional decision. Right, Like The mistake they make isn't because they're a a jerk or an idiot. The mistake they make is because they got caught up in how they felt about something to the point where that, that emotion interfered with their logic. And they acted out of an emotional uh, response rather than one that required a little bit of introspection. I'm writing a character kind of like that right now. <laughs> yeah. She's, well, those are the best ones. Yeah. I mean, like, it's kind of interesting because I've never written a character like that. She's kind of moody and she's kind of standoffish and she's like, you know, in a situation where she is not, it's not in her control and she doesn't like it. And, you know, she's very disgruntled about it. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm writing it and she's kind of, yeah, she's kind of a little hotheaded. And so some of the stuff that, some of the stuff that she does is because she's, you know, she's a little disgruntled, uh, disgruntled about her situation. And so she's making these emotional choices, even though she thinks like she's so logical and everybody else around her is crazy. And she's actually the one that's like, you know, kind of being a hothead. Yeah. Uh, you know, you watch a lot of like, um, and it's on Netflix now, um, you know, is, is those old Twilight Zone movies. They've yeah. got four seasons of Twilight Zone on Netflix right now. You watch those, they're not even 30 minutes long. But the amount of writing that goes into that uh, of character and what the decisions that people make, and most of it is ultimately, with a very broad paintbrush here, man's in humanity to man. Right, right. Yeah. Um, but... But there are so many other narratives that it doesn't have to be like set in a, in a big place. Like you know, Maureen's Black Bottom that came out recently, uh, based on August Wilson play. Um, and a lot of people, I think, watching it not knowing that it was based on a play, kind of went into it going, "Well, I thought this was going to be a big musical thing." Yeah, but it's really just about this tension of, of old versus new, uh, of, of someone who's trying to hold on to what she built versus someone who's trying to grasp what he doesn't have yet. Mm. Uh, and, in, and in a way, they, they all wind up losing you know, uh, through their own action. And this is the thing about writing characters is you've got to make sure that everything they do comes from their action. It doesn't happen to them. If it happens to them, what's the point of writing about them? Right, right. 
we were talking about that the last hour. We've got to do the station break here, um, yeah. David, but I want to talk about that because one of the things in the last hour I was talking with uh, Jayla Lawton about was taking that ownership of what you do, your feelings, your thoughts, your emotions, and the things that happen in your life. You take ownership over them, and I'm glad that you brought that up because it is, you know, it's very boring in storytelling when something ha- you know, like they talk about active versus passive tense. It's very boring when something happens, you know, the to the person versus them acting and doing. So mm-hmm. I love that idea. We're going to take a station break, everybody. Uh, thank you for tuning in today. You're listening to The Adam Messer Show. And my special guest today with me is David Harlan Rousseau. And you are here with us on WRULP Savannah, Georgia. WRUU is a community radio station. It doesn't just mean that we invite the community to create programming. And it doesn't just mean that we are a voice for the community. It also means that we are counting on the community to keep us going. And you are the community. Almost all of our modest budget comes from small annual or monthly donations from listeners like you. You get to enjoy our community-focused programming because many others have stepped forward to do their part. Now do your part by joining our community of listener donors. Go to WRUU.org right now and make a one-time or monthly donation. And thank you for supporting Savannah's community radio station, 107.5 FM. This is a message from the Georgia State Department of Public Health. There is a State of Georgia hotline people can call with questions or if they think they may have been exposed to the COVID-19 virus. It is one 1- 844-442-2681. If you believe you're experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 or have been exposed to the novel coronavirus, please contact your primary care doctor, an urgent care clinic, or your local federally qualified health care center. Please do not show up at an emergency room or health care facility unannounced. More information can be found at DPH. Dot Georgia, dot gov. From our cobblestone streets to our stately homes, discover Savannah's maritime history and what makes Savannah, Savannah. One of the hidden secrets of Savannah is the gardens of the Ships of the Sea Museum. Picnic here and enjoy our complimentary Wi-Fi. More information can be found at shipsofthesea.org. You are listening to WRUULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM. WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings, community radio with Global Soul. This is Sounds of Tarab from the album Zanzibar, New York. All right, everybody. Welcome back, and thank you for tuning in today. This is the Adam Messer Show, and I'm your special I'm your special guest host. <laughs> Getting all tongue tied here, David. I'm your guest host, uh, Adam Messer, here on the Adam Messer Show, and my special guest today is David Harlan Rousseau. We've been talking about the art of storytelling. Um, so, David, like right before the break, um, I feel like you yep. had a great uh, revelation there. Can you can you share more with us? Yeah, uh, yeah, we're, we're talking about that that stories don't happen to people. Story happens because of people. Stories happen because of people. Here's a great uh, quote by Raymond Chandler, uh, and this is I had to look it up, but this is a direct quote uh, from Chandler himself. So uh, the quote is: "The story is this man's adventure in search of a hidden truth, and there would be no adventure if it did not happen to a man fit for adventure." Now, I recognize that's not the most inclusive language, but the point is, uh, is a good story is about the search for a hidden truth, and that the adventure doesn't happen if the character isn't fit for adventure. You know, I feel like that's so important because as a writer, I'm sure you feel this way too, like there are certain characters that just take I mean, they all take their own lives and, and go whatever way that they want to go. But the, I've had some characters where I'm, I'm really surprised at how they developed over time. And, mm-hmm. you know, one of the things I find interesting when you say that and talk about that is because have you ever, well, 
we've been talking about movies and television shows and stuff like that. But have you ever watched something that was just completely flat and you're like, where is this? Why is this character so flat and they're boring? You know, um, and there, there's there's really no no growth, no no anything with them. I mean, there's no problems. It's just they're just flat. Yeah, and then it makes you wonder how the thing ever got produced. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, you know, what 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 is going on here? Why, you know? And sometimes, like a side character might be more interesting than you know, like an auxiliary character is more interesting than the main character, or it might just be the way that the the actors doing it. But you're like, and I watch I watched a series. I don't want to name the series, but I watched a series recently that came out with a couple of my favorite actors, and I was so bored with it because the the character was flat was so flat i was disappointed um with the series and it was a couple of actors i really love watching them you know and i've followed them over you know a, a period of time now and when i started watching this the new series i was like oh, this is just awful you know and, and it wasn't a bad premise it was a really good premise i thought it was just that the way that they played the character and there was like you know no character development in my opinion um, mm-hmm. I felt like the side characters were more interesting than the main character. So I don't know. I, and I'm not trying to be too yeah. judgy or anything like that, but it's just, it's one of those things like, well, you know, is this person doing the action or are they, you know, or are they constantly, everything happens to them. And it's like, Oh, you know, everything happened. Oh, it's so boring. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and I think that that, and that, that leads to a whole other series of questions about the narrative and about storytelling. And look, I, I'll be the first one to tell anybody that I'm still learning the crap. Right, right. Yeah. Oh, but I'm I definitely not a master that. of the art, but, you know, I'm just saying. No, I mean, you know, but, but the thing is, in order to get to be a master of the art, you do have to be critical about what you're reading, what you're consuming, what you're writing. You know, like projects that I work on these days, uh I don't move on to the next scene until I've read through the, the scene that I'm working on several times. Now, and not necessarily wordsmithing, but would the character do this? Does this get us anywhere in the narrative? Does this character take action? Uh, or is something been put in place where they're going to need to take action in the next one? Did the scene start off in a positive way and end in a negative way or vice versa? Or, or are we putting a, a, a question, a mystery, intrigue, or suspense of any kind at any level, uh, in the minds of the the reader. Oh, why did they go into that door? Why did they sit in the car for 10 minutes before turning on the ignition? Something like that. Something real simple like that can can build a little bit of intrigue about the character's motives, what they like, what they don't like, all these sorts of things. Um, And in that regard, it's, it's really thinking about, all right, well, if this story suddenly the supporting character is far more interesting than the main character maybe my story really is about this character instead and if so why i think that's a great question and i i I don't know who said it but uh the rule about like if there's a gun in act one it has to go off in act three Mm -hmm. i i don't remember remember who said it but it's like everything has to have a purpose or it has to have a reason you know like if you're talking about them eating dinner you know, is it just a is it just to set the, the stage? You know, is there something you know with with eating dinner that's important to the scene, or is it just like, oh, I just wanted to fill, you know put in filler, so I wrote, you know, that they were eating dinner. You know, does it does it actually make sense why they're eating dinner, or just was I just putting in filler? Well, yeah, uh, certainly there's that, and and it's Chekhov that said that by the way, Anton Chekhov. Oh, okay, thank you. The, Check out. It, it, it was it, it was built on the front the, the idea of false premises more than the gun itself, more right. than the prop itself. Right. So, uh, if you have a character in your narrative that's staring at a painting for an un- unreasonably long time, and we never ever again hear about the painting or why the character was staring at it, uh, this is a problem. <laughs> Right. Because right. We, we planted the seed in the mind of the reader, but we never watered it, we never fertilized it, we never brought it to fruition. We just let it go fallow. And that that can't be uh, in that regard. Yeah. Uh, so this is something else to really be thinking about. Like, why did we have that character stare at that painting for an hour? 
Is there a clue? Is it a link to the past? Is it inspiration for the future? Um, is, it a, is it a message, a dire warning? What is the purpose of this? And if that's not answered later on, or if it's not a payoff or something that was set up earlier, or something that builds the narrative, then why have it in there? You know, yeah, so you how does it to, move the story forward? You know, is it is it actually helping move the story forward or not? You know, exactly. And if it doesn't, then you have to take Arthur Quiller's couch, uh, Sir Arthur Quiller couch's advice, and murder your darling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, it's funny. Like uh, <laughs> when I first heard that phrase, I, okay, so I've I've only been writing fiction. Um, oh, since about twenty fifteen or so. Um, and when I first heard that, I was like, okay, well that means like, you know, kill off your, your favorites or whatever. And that, I guess some of them do that, but it also means like writing them out completely, like getting rid of them, like just cutting them out, editing them out completely. <laughs> like they never happened, you know? Well, it's in the service of the narrative. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. What, what is that? Uh, Hail Caesar. I don't George know. Clooney character sitting across from Brolin's character, and and Clooney won't shut up about this this event. Now he's completely inspired by you know the communists, uh, and 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 has his doubts about the studio system, and he just won't shut up. <laughs> uh, and Brolin gets up from the desk and slaps him around, yeah, uh, and and basically tells the man that you the picture has worth because you serve the picture, and you have worth because you serve the picture now um ah, okay. so, so it was just it's all about the, the purpose of I, I i completely butchered that line that's okay but it's all in the service of, of the narrative yeah i i feel like that um it it all goes back to storytelling david i mean like that's how i feel with any good story uh it, it goes back to the storytelling it goes back to like okay well you know there's a setup you know there's all this stuff that goes on and it's like well there, there's got to be i hate to say it just as simple as elementary as this is but there's got to be a beginning a middle and an end and yeah, if nothing else yeah yeah i mean like that's you know that's the simplest form of a story i could think of and i feel i feel like it kind of misses the mark sometimes because like going back to save the cat i love i love to save the cat and i love the blake snyder stuff even i love uh jessica um uh, oh gosh she wrote save the cat writes a novel and is based off of jake snyder's i mean blake snyder's save the cat blake snyder's, yeah. yeah i love i love that uh jessica brody um but the formula sometimes i feel like has been overused and when yeah. if somebody doesn't hit all of the beats they make the formula not add up correctly it doesn't come out the same way. The reason why the formula works is because it's like here's the hero's journey, and these are the different beats that you hit with the hero's journey when you're going through that form of storytelling. But if you miss those beats, or if you, you know, if you kind of discombobulate them and throw the audience, you know, out there, kind of like, oh, well, you got to figure it out. It's not going to work. It's just not going to. It's just not going to work because people don't like disjointed storytelling like that. You know, it's okay. You like, gotta get your, go ahead. You, you got to get your viewers and readers out of the puzzle solving business. Right. I mean, you know, even, even if you're writing a mystery, uh, you know, you at the end of the mystery have to put all the pieces together um, for the reader and, or the viewer in such a way that they feel they've solved it. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 so in that regard, also, you got to get your readers and viewers out of the puzzle solving business. But at the same time, you also have to assume that your readers are smarter than you are. And you don't want to give the punchline before the joke. You know, it's just, no. it just doesn't happen. You don't. Uh, unless, that, unless that is the joke. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I, I tell you what, I think that's uh, so important. And it goes back to like what you said earlier about being relatable. Um, you know, any kind of storytelling. Like I was talking with Jayla last hour, we were talking about poetry, for example. You know, in poetry, you share a lot of, you know, emotions and thoughts and, you know, you try to share, you know, like a window, you know, of what's going on. I feel like this is the same way with any form of storytelling, you know, whether it's screenwriting, you know, novel. I mean, it could be, I mean, look at all the tearjerker commercials that they put out during, you know, 
any kind of super game that's out there. You know what I mean? Like those, yeah. those are designed to evoke emotions in you. You know what I mean? And there's a reason because those emotions connect with you. <laughs> And it's a thirty-second yeah, commercial, uh, right? <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I mean, certainly there's there's people out there who are really brilliant about it. It could be in Silverstein um, as advertisers. Those people are just you know super amazing. Uh, what they did with like E Trade a few years back wasn't necessarily like you know, the tearjerker was. Which, quite frankly, people like me tend to get offended by certain commercials like that because it feels like we're being manipulated and not in a good way. Right. Right. You didn't invite me to go on the ride. You didn't invite me to feel a certain way. You told me how I'm supposed to feel in this moment. Right. And that just turns me right off. But uh, but one of the things, for example, in telling a story, and advertising is no different in that regard, but one of the brilliant things that Goodby and Silverstein did was they got the audience participation in a very interesting way. They had each trade commercial in the Super Bowl, and what they had was a garage and a couple of real down-home, salt-of-the-earth people sitting in the garage and in between them was a chimpanzee wearing an e-trade t-shirt jumping up and down being a chimpanzee okay and i haven't and seen of it, course, when but... it oh it, yeah but it's, it's a few years old yeah but it goes it goes way back but, but the funny part about it is that people who were in sports bars watching this thing would be saying oh my god what that's just what a waste of money that commercial is so ridiculous, and right as they're saying it, up pops the plate at the end of the commercial saying, we just blew $2 million on this ad. Hopefully you're smarter with your money. <laughs> and then they pop the name of the company. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, and and then, then everybody finally got the joke. Yeah. But, they, but that's that's an example where like, oh, why didn't I see that coming? Yeah, yeah. that's funny. They, 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 the hook's in there, the bait's on the hook, and they went grab the hold of that thing like there was no tomorrow and then realize oh there's a hook in my mouth oh uh, uh, yeah yeah uh, that's, that's that's the, fun. that's the cool thing about it because like i'm listening i didn't see the commercial i'm listening to you and then like you know i fell for it i'm like oh what's where's this going and then it's like oh well we're we're, we're smarter with your money than we were <laughs> so yeah yeah ever you tune in today uh to wruulp savannah georgia 107.5 fm wru.org we are Savannah Soundings Community Radio with Global Soul. This is the Adam Messer Show, and I'm your host, Adam Messer. And I'm here today with my special guest, David Harlan Rousseau. And uh, we've been talking about uh, storytelling, sto- um, which I feel like is a great subject. Uh, we have not really talked a lot. We've got about 10 minutes. Well, not even 10 minutes. We've got about eight minutes left, uh, David. But yeah. um, you are also an actor. You said you're a professor. Um, you're, you're a writer. Uh, what, what projects have you been working on lately? Uh, let's see. Well, currently, right now, I'm in the midst of preparing for the quarter. So I've got a couple of storyboarding classes that I'm getting ready for, and a drawing one class that I'm uh, rebuilding uh, for the start of the quarter. Uh, so that's been dominating a lot of my time. Uh, but at the same time, I'm also uh, writing a spec script uh, for a series. So uh, it was a relationship between a father and a son. Won't get too much more into it than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, but it's, it's a, a father and son relationship. It's got a bit of nostalgia. It's, it's set in a very specific uh, time frame. I've tapped into some nostalgia uh, there. So uh, working on that, um, and just constantly, you know, studying and paying attention to things. I guess most recently, as far as credits go, uh, I had a small team um, with Alicia uh, Vikander in the Glorias. That was shot here in Savannah. Oh, great. Now, that was a good bit of fun. Yeah. Um, and Julie Taymor is a fantastic director, so I can't say enough positive things about her. And right around the same time, I did storyboards for Emperor, oh, uh, which wow. was released fairly recently, too. So, a little bit of everything. Uh, let me ask you, since we got a couple minutes left, um, let's yeah. just say somebody out there, you know, they're not going a traditional uh, route with, uh, like, going to an art school or something like that. What's a good way that they can get into that line of work or what's a way that they can kind of learn that craft? Which craft? <laughs> Storyboarding uh, and that, that kind of thing and getting involved okay, so, in like, uh, you know, uh, film production. So, so on the storyboarding end of things, one of the ways, of course, I mean, these days it's so much easier because there's YouTube 
channels galore. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there's a book that uh, Ben Phillips and I co-wrote called Storyboarding Essentials, uh, which is published by Random House. So you can start by reading that. You can reverse engineer a film. If you have any drawing skill whatsoever, you can you know, reverse engineer a movie and look at the aspect ratio and figure out the proportions of the frame and then just stop the video, pause the video every now and then and try and draw what you see and then try and understand composition and how those relate. Um, watch movies three or four different ways. And what I mean by that is this. Watch it for enjoyment first. Just, just, just enjoy it. Mm-hmm. But then if you wish to be an actor, if you are acting, then you'll want to pay attention to performances and ask yourself questions. Why did they make these choices? What choices would I have made if I were cast in that role? Yeah, that was a really interesting point. It really held that moment for a really, really long time. Same thing with directing, same thing with writing. Why did the writer choose to structure this in this way? I would have done it in a different way. Doesn't mean your way's right, but their way got produced. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, so really be paying attention. If you, you can download scripts, there's several places uh, on the line right now. It doesn't take much more than 30 seconds of searching, literally. And you can get uh, places where you can get scripts that are either the production scripts or the spec scripts and read to that. See how they're structured. What is the language they use? Different screenwriters use different techniques. And of course, there's other things. Uh, and, and again, all of this is assuming that you are unable to go to um, a place of higher education. Uh, there's things like master class. Um, which uh, is a subscription service that has people talking about what they do professionally. You know? So if you really love television, you know, Shonda Rhimes, Aaron Sorkin, their, their master classes are excellent, and they often come with supplemental material so that you can you know, follow along, take notes, read mm-hmm. a good bit about it as needed. So I- these are all good ways. Reverse engineering is a really that analysis, that ability to analyze, is a really good way. You mentioned Save the Cat. Save mm-hmm. the Cat is a good place to start, but it can be a trap if you're not careful. Mm-hmm. You can literalize that way too much. If you have time, Robert McKee's story is excellent as well. And then there's always something to be said, too, for cutting your teeth in time competitions like the Savannah 48 Hour Film Project mm-hmm. uh, that takes place annually. Uh, you know, that's one of the, of the big challenges that you have. When, oh, you got 48 hours, which basically means if you're writing the thing, you've got two or three hours to write a fairly well-structured short film <laughs> yeah. uh, that can be produced that weekend and then turned in at the end of that weekend. So that kind of pressure really gets you to think very clearly, very quickly, very firmly about some serious decisions you have to make with regards to that narrative. It's not always going to be great, but there is a benefit of doing something like the 48 or other time festivals where you have those limitations, usually in terms of time. You put it out there, you get the feedback, and yeah, you're going to wince. You're going to totally wince at what you're seeing on the screen because there's a million other choices that you would have made. But seeing that and getting that feedback is invaluable because it really is a strong education for anyone who really truly cares about the narrative and I guess the other thing I would have to say is be curious. Hmm. Great... If you're not curious uh-huh. about the world around you, if you're not curious about the craft, don't even start. Don't don't waste your time on everybody else's. If you don't genuinely care about the craft, that it doesn't matter if it's storyboarding or acting, mm-hmm. don't be a wannabe. Worst thing in the world is to be a has-been, to go from wannabe to has-been, but that hasn't been a somebody in the middle. Hmm. That's an interesting way to put it, David. I, uh, it takes a long time to get to somebody. You know, I, I'm, I love I'm that. In my fifties, I'm still working at it. Well, I love I love that because the you know philosophy behind it is you know do the work. That's one of the things that I uh, my friends and I we talk about a lot is and I appreciate the people who are the doers, the people that execute and go out there because it's one thing to talk about it and it's a one you know one thing to be you know like a want to be like you said. Uh, there are a lot of those people. There are a lot of idea people. <laughs> Um, there are a lot fewer people who actually take any kind of action, and there are a lot less people who are you know the ones who execute and finish. 
So, yeah, I'm, I really appreciate that you brought that up and said that because that's I feel like it's so important to anything in life, not just acting or filmmaking or whatever, anything in life that you want to do. You've got to take the action. You've got to finish and you've got to you know, do the work. So I really appreciate Absolutely. you saying that. So, well, um, we've got about a minute left, David. Uh, I've really been having fun. Uh, I know we're going to have to have you back on um, in the spring. But uh, where can people check out uh, more information about your stuff? Okay, well, you can go to um, IMDb and check out my IMDb page there. Uh, so, uh, imdb.me slash David Harland Rousseau, or just type in all three names. Uh, if you do an IMDb, do a search, it'll pop up there. Uh, you can watch um, some of my short films on my YouTube channel. So just YouTube and then search all three names and you'll get up my short films uh, channel there as well. Um, that's a good place to start. Uh, those two areas, um, if you want to read a little bit more about what I've been doing and look at some older works there uh, to see, especially the time competition stuff that we put together. So uh, that's very helpful there. That's awesome. And I'll have a link um, also on the podcast uh, to your pages. And uh, so, Wonderful. yeah, thank you very much, David, for being here today with us on the um, on the radio. Thank you, Adam. Been a pleasure. All right, everybody, tune in. Because-